Okay, we can start our um, first talk. Um, uh, the speaker for our first talk today is Stephen Plaza from Genelia. Um, his talk's title is uh, Connectome of the Fly Central Brain and Implications for Analysis. Please. Thank you. Um, uh, very excited to be here. And I guess good morning, good afternoon, good uh, evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, definitely interesting times. Um, I think uh, one of the things that, I, that I, we do lose a little bit is obviously the interactivity, but I think this is a great opportunity to be thankful for the fact that we can still have talks like this um, and get a lot of our work done remotely. So um, I think that's obviously very good. So anyways, uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll go into my talk. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar or have heard about the uh, connectome called the Hemibrain connectome that that my group uh, released in the last few weeks in collaboration with Google. In this talk, I'll uh, discuss a bit about this, the connectome that we've released, and, and as the title says, some of the implications for analysis. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, maybe I think it, it's useful to start off with a uh, very quick uh, kind of description of sort of what, what my group does. Um, the project at Genelia that, that orchestrated this is called the Flying M Project. Um, for those that are not familiar with uh, the way Genelia works, there's this concept called team projects, and the team projects um, facilitate a collaborative uh, working environment between multiple scientists um, and also different uh, staff scientists. The goal is to satisfy different short-term and long-term goals defined by some kind of steering committee. So in this case, our goal is to take EM data, so we have our, our data here, and to um, extract out neuronal shapes and synapses to make a cell library and a connect, uh, connectivity library, and, and finally, of course, a graph that people can analyze. Okay, so the, um, the, the, the outline uh, seems pretty simple. Uh, I talk about what, how, now what, and how. Um, and in particular, um, we're gonna talk about what did we actually produce. So this will be a little bit more of just kind of a survey of, of the different things that we did. Um, the methodology, the how um, we actually did it, um, some of the next steps so that people are aware of some of the things that we're going to be doing next is maybe as a resource for the community, but also uh, just in general, maybe what it means for the field of connectomics and how that might accelerate uh, various research efforts um, that might be of interest to different people in the audience. And then also how um, to actually uh, use this data, uh, because it is a lot of data and it's not trivial to, to, to use. Um, oh, sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction. Okay, and then also some initial findings. Okay, so the Hemibrain data set, um, and we call it the Hemibrain data set, it's not, we're not using an overly scientific word, it is roughly about half of the, the central brain. Um, there, um, we tried to get some of the, the left side as well um, to account for symmetric circuits that might exist along the midline. Um, but the, the initial goal that we had when we started this reconstruction um, was to understand um, fly, associative learning, sleep, um, and, and navigation a little bit better, navigational circuitry. Um, a secondary goal, but, but probably maybe actually equally important, was to provide a resource for the community um, that you could just look up uh, connections for neurons of interest. So rather than having to go in there and, and do tracing and do work yourself, actually have a lookup table um, that people could use to, um, to, to figure out um, what they're interested in, in studying. Um, you may have seen this video before. Um, I like showing it uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, one is to actually explain why this video is not very useful. Uh, and the other one is to highlight um, how hard it is to make a video like this. Uh, there's a lot of neurons and the rendering time alone is very uh, tricky. But the reason why I kind of like to point out why it's not very useful is there's a lot of complexity to the data. We're actually showing a small fraction of, of, of neurons that innervate different compartments that we reconstructed. Um, overall, about 25,000 neurons uh, were reconstructed to make this dense or comprehensive connectome for this uh, central brain region. Um, this entails about 20 million uh, synapses. Um, and as you can see, you, know, you, you only have to show a subset of these neurons for things to very quickly look like you know, a bowl of spaghetti. Um, so we have to really um, subset the neurons into different regions to make it a little bit more uh, interpretable. Um, one thing of note uh, is that this effort took um, a lot of proofreading effort, a lot of technicians that had to work on this in addition to a lot of the algorithms that we worked on. Um, we, we had about 50 to 100 proofreading working years that were on this uh, data set over about around a two year period. So we actually have over 50 technicians that work at Genelia 
that um, were, were actively um, involved in this data set in addition to a team of lab scientists. Um, so that's sort of like at a high level, okay, that's what the data set in, entails. Um, we have the connectivity in those neurons uh, for, those, uh, uh, for that region. But I also want to explain a couple other uh, facets of the data set. Um, we very carefully defined uh, many of the brain regions that um, go through the hemibrain. Now, at a, at, a, at a very superficial level, this really just follows previous atlases. We weren't trying to redefine brain regions um, completely, at least not yet. Um, but a couple things of note is that because we actually have, th this is showing um, data um, at the synaptic level where, where it kind of looks like a point cloud, like an NC82 staining. You could see neuronal boundaries looking at just this information. But one of the things that, of course, a very detailed connectome can allow you to do is to really look at a more, uh, you know, at a more comprehensive level to make sure that, that, that neurons that are in certain regions, are crossing certain regions, that actually forms a clean boundary. And one of the things that we noticed is that, and maybe not surprisingly to some, that many of the boundaries are not very well defined. Um, and so I suspect that there's going to continue to be some revision for some of these regions over time. But at least for um, this data set, we, we made a lot of effort to try to be as precise as we could um, with these boundaries using multiple modes of, of data, whether it was the synaptic um, point cloud information that kind of shows you the different neuropills, or whether we're looking at uh, neuron innervation patterns, et cetera. Um, as I had mentioned before, um, the honey brain doesn't obviously include the whole brain. Uh, notably, um, areas of the optic lobe, you don't have to, to read this whole chart, this just shows a, a hierarchy breakdown of the of Drosophila fly for people that are very familiar with the fly, this is all pretty obvious. Um, but for the optic lobe, um, we don't have any of the lamina, but we actually do have a sizable portion of a lobula. And one of the nice things uh, about the data set is even though we don't have a large chunk of the optic lobe, we can identify a lot of the neurons that are, or that are coming from there, um, which allows us to do some uh, processing of downstream information, allow us to analyze um, downstream information from these optic uh, uh, lobes. Uh, this chart here um, shows uh, sort of the boundary that exists between uh, each pair of adjacent uh, brain regions. Um, the larger the circle, the bigger the boundary. This is on log scale. Uh, the only reason I'm highlighting this is not for you to really uh, observe the data, except that we can actually measure this uh, in a reasonable way, which is kind of cool. But to highlight this next chart, um, which shows the fidelity of those boundaries. Now, in this, uh, this uh, chart here, bigger is worse. And, and how I'm measuring fidelity is the amount of neuron crossings, the number of wires, essentially, that are crossing a boundary. So you can think of this in a graph partitioning sense, like a min-cut algorithm you want to have few um, cut wires, and that usually means a, a good boundary. Um, because you can have situations, of course, a neuron's got to cross a boundary, we don't penalize a neuron that crosses a boundary once. But if a neuron crosses a boundary more than once, the circle um, gets bigger and bigger. And it's useful to note this, because for some regions, like the crepine is a good example, um, it does have some maybe less ideal boundaries with the LAL and SMP. So this might indicate, and we're going to kind of revise this probably over the course of several months and years, uh, maybe regions that don't really form a very clear dividing line, at least in terms of the wiring. Um, there's other ways, of course, that one could um, divide um, the brain regions, presumably. Um, another thing, um, oh, I should, I should warn everybody in the audience that, you know, I am at home. So if you hear any crying or anything, it's probably my kids. Uh, so I, I apologize for that, but I guess there'll be any, uh, some side entertainment if the, if the talk gets too boring. Um, the other downside of these virtual talks is I have no idea, I can't hear any groans uh, in the audience uh, for any of my bad jokes. So we'll just have to uh, make do uh, with the format. Uh, so I talked a bit about the brain regions that we identified um, in the honey brain. Um, we also spent a lot of time trying to um, uh, identify the cell types um, that exist in, in the data set. Now this is very tricky. Um, there's a lot of definitions that people may have or, or concepts of what people might have as a cell type. Taxonomy in general is a naturally slippery field, no matter what scientific domain you're in. Um, in this sense, we're trying to do something that's a little bit close to what people have been doing in the light community, where we kind of have these very specific distinct types for different morphological types. But now we have the ability to use connectivity as well. Um, this is very useful because morphology alone can be very ambiguous in some cases. Um, this is an example of two neurons that I'm showing here, um, this PEN neuron um, and another PEN neuron. And in this case, they look morphologically very similar. They innervate regions of the, um, the first rural bridge uh, very similarly. Um, but yet, if you look at their connectivity, 
the inputs and outputs that they have are very different. Um, the inputs that they have, for instance, they receive inputs from this neuron, these two different neurons that are very different from each other. And this is something that we can see very easily um, using, uh, uh, using uh, uh, the connectomic information that we have. So the general procedure that we, we tried to follow, because again, this is a lot of data, and, and again, one of the challenges I think a lot of people are gonna have is that as some of these te uh, techniques become more online, we're gonna identify more neurons than anybody's ever been able to do with sparse studies using 10 focal data. Um, this allows us to look at almost everything at once with, well, of course, some effort. Um, and the process that we're trying to do um, is, is as follows, is that we are kind of breaking it down a little bit. So we first start off by identifying the cell body fiber. So in the Drosophila, um, you have situations where the soma or the nucleus is on the outside of the neuropil, and then it has these tracks that kind of uh, feed into the neuropil. And, and, and many times things of the same lineage track together. Um, and we typically observe that, that neurons of the same, top, same cell type tend to be in the same cluster. So we kind of broke this down into first grouping neurons together in these cell body fiber groups um, using a tool like NBLAST, which is a morphological comparison tool to see if neurons look similar or not. We use this to form an initial, um, uh, initial uh, grouping of these neurons. Then um, we use a tool called CBLAST. Uh, this is a tool that FlyM had developed. It uses connectivity um, based features to cluster these neurons. And then there's this iterative process where we kind of refine, look at the clusters, uh, make a determination, and then and, and modify the types accordingly. Um, this is a subjective process um, sprinkled in with some objectivity. So there will be sometimes some disagreements uh, between the so-called lumpers and splitters of the taxonomy community. Um, CBLAST, um, I just want to describe very quickly. It's actually relatively um, simple, um, I think, uh, uh, metric. Um, it uses a set of uh, features uh, per neuron. So this is a neuron ID. So each neuron has a unique identifier and its inputs or outputs are represented uh, here as, as a weighted feature vector um, and it's, it's broken down by type. So you might notice already that this is a, a bit of a, a circular um, definition. Um, and, and as a result, um, let's hold on a second. Sorry, I'm trying to get my, uh, my controls up. Okay. Um, good. Um, so this is a little bit of a circular definition um, where you obviously have to know the cell type in order to group neurons together by cell type. Um, so what we actually do is this kind of this iterative uh, process um, where the, um, the user seeds the initial, um, uh, uh, the initial feature vector with some features that were determined by NBLAST, maybe brain region, innervation patterns. You cluster this information, you, you assign a putative cell type, then you use this to generate features that you can then uh, cluster on, and then you repeat um, over and over again until you get some level of convergence, um, et cetera. Um, we use this procedure. Um, in the data set, I just wanted to give you a sense of what the users are seeing. This chart here um, shows um, five different uh, morphology types. So again, we're looking at a neuron, we'll say, oh, look, these look different. So we had five different classes of neurons that look distinct from each other, and then we applied CBLAST over it. And, and for the most part, obviously, you can see the separation seems to conform to the morphology, but you know, there are definitely situations here where there appears to be two different smaller clusters of a given morphology that are separated. This is using a dimensional reduction tool, uh, UMAP, um, to do the visualization, which has its limits, but at least to provide some feedback for the user. Um, and so in this case, we actually split these into two different connectivity types because you could then look into that data and you could say, oh, this does look a little bit distinct. It does have some different inputs and outputs. Um, but conversely, there are other situations here where two different morphologies could have a very similar connectivity, but the morphology looks distinct. Um, for our, our classification that we did in the hemibrain, we're, we're, we're actually taking kind of the intersection of these criteria. So if the morphology is distinct and the connectivity is distinct, we're calling them different cell types. So this is a, a fine granularity um, kind of breakdown of, 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 of neurons. And this chart here kind of emphasizes that um, this shows the number of neurons that have only one neuron uh, in, a, in, a, in a cell type or two neurons in a given cell type, three, et cetera. Um, so you notice a, a large number that only have a single member. Um, this actually should be probably two in practice as most of the time if you have a, a neuron um, because of the symmetry in the brain, you're going to have a, a matching neuron on the other, other side of the brain. Um, because this is hemibrain, we only have about one half. 
Um, actually, with uh, we're continuing to revise this to this day. We're actually going to have a new revision of this data set in a couple months. Um, and we actually did find many more matches um, for some of the neurons in this regime here. Um, but I think a natural question you might have is, is do you have groupings of these neurons or do we have a taxonomy tree that relates similar neurons together? Uh, we've not done this explicitly, um, except for noting that some neurons are grouped together in a common cell body um, fi or fiber, um, as I mentioned a couple, uh, a couple slides earlier. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit later about how you can find neurons that have very similar innervation patterns to brain regions. So you can kind of think of this as a, as a higher level um, grouping of, of neurons. Um, in terms of how we named um, these neurons, um, we tried to, as best we could, to use any of the famous neuron names that existed. This would exist in, in many of the situations in the fly where you have kind of focal image data and people are familiar with these neurons. They've, they've given it cell types, so we've tried to um, respect that naming convention. Um, for ones that are not, and this is kind of a, a work in progress, but our current uh, release of data actually combines the cell body fiber name with some kind of morphological type identifier and then some connectivity type identifier if needed. Um, this needed to be applied to about 10,000 completely unknown neurons um, in the Terra incognita. Um, and this has a, a label of, 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 of PCT for putative cell type. Um, I think in the next couple months, this should be standardized a little bit better. We hope to rename a lot of these neurons, probably using the primary brain region that the neuron innervates um, using various uh, heuristics. Okay, um, this is a, a little bit maybe of a, of a pedantic uh, point, but important um, is that we have a notion of completeness, reconstruction completeness. So I, I talked about the data set. You might be thinking, okay, well, this is great. I have a connectome, um, it's perfect, it's great. Uh, well, we hope people mostly think that, but it's important to realize that this is a data set that was curated, that had um, a mixture of automated algorithms and manual um, uh, uh, efforts, and I'll talk about that more later in the talk. And as such, we couldn't proofread or edit every part of the data set as, as perfectly as we would like. Um, and so we have a notion of, of completeness, um, and a completeness percentage is the uh, percentage of connections that are in trace neurons. And notably for the Hemibrain data set, um, about 30, 35% of all um, the connections are in trace neurons. Now that might on the surface sound really bad, um, but in practice, because there's a lot of redundancy um, in connections in the fly brain and in other organisms, you don't need to get 100% of all the connections right. But clearly the, the more uh, completeness you have, and we do have varying completeness levels in different regions of the, of the hemibrain, um, the more confident you could be of certain types of analyses. Um, so with that, you can kind of um, break it down maybe mentally, uh, you know, as if you have a small connection, so if A and B, neuron A and neuron B are connected and there's only a few connections between them, it's probably correct. Um, but because it's smaller, maybe it's not as important. Uh, we actually notice a lot of this in the fly brain, a lot of small connections that I think their mechanistic impact is not completely clear um, at this time. Um, the medium connections most likely exist. Um, I think you can look at the completeness numbers to maybe estimate how much it actually how big the connection might actually be for um, if you were to do 100% uh, complete reconstruction. And then large connections that, you know, are almost always significant. So I think I, I'm showing this in a, in a crude sense, but I just wanted to give you a feel that when you're using the data set, I think, you know, use it, trust the numbers, but at least in the back of your mind, know that, you know, if, if the connections are a little bit weaker, there's probably a larger error bar that you need to be worried about. Um, Okay, so this might help color the previous discussion a bit, but how do we um, produce the data set? Um, so for people that are familiar with EM connectomics, this is uh, probably a relatively standard looking uh, type of slide. Um, the process uh, has several stages, and this is one of the reasons why we needed a project team is that there's a lot of aspects um, of the work that involves a lot of different expertise. We have a uh, dissection, uh, preparation, uh, part of the workflow, Imaging, um, we're using focused ion beam, um, SEM imaging, which I'll talk about very briefly shortly. Once you have a set of images, so you're taking like these 2D snapshots, they have to be um, combined together into a 3D volume, registered into a 3D volume. And then there's a procedure of using automatic tools to segment the data into different neurons to automatically predict the synapses. And then proofreaders or, or technicians that go through to edit these various predictions. And this kind of is an iterative process. And then the goal is eventually you have something that you can analyze. Um, for those that are not familiar, one of the things that um, FlyM, in particular the uh, HESS lab at Genelia, really pioneered is this focused ion beam um, SEM approach. Um, and so uh, 
the, the basic idea here is that people classically, when they're using electron microscopy, would section their data using a, something like a diamond knife, maybe 30, 40, 50 nanometer thick slices, which sound very thin, except when the in-plane resolution is substantially smaller, like eight or four nanometers. Um, and so what you could do with a focused ion beam is that you can cut and polish the surface even just a couple nanometers at a time. We use eight nanometer um, cut and eight nanometer uh, in-plane resolution. And the result of this is producing these very nice isotropic volumes. Um, this just shows an example of how the quality of the image data as you slice it in your kind of traditional image plane, XY plane, XZ plane, and YZ plane, how it looks very good in every orientation. This is particularly advantageous when you're trying to do things like image segmentation um, or other types of analysis. The hemibrain reconstruction, I just have a little bit of a coloring diagram here. This shows the fly brain and its nerve cord or something like the uh, fly spinal cord. This shows the region that the hemibrain approximately lies in. Um, notably, um, we actually do section the data set into these thicker slabs, as we call them. These are about 20 uh, micron thick uh, sections that each of these can then be independently uh, imaged with a focused IMB and SEM system. Um, this allows us to solve a couple technical issues with the uh, limited field of view that can exist with a focused ion beam, but at the same time also lets us do um, this imaging in parallel with multiple FIB sub machines to accelerate the process. Uh, this uh, here is an example um, of alignment that was done by an alignment group that's shown on the bottom. Um, this shows the, um, the quality of the data looking at three different orientations which I mentioned before, kind of facilitates different types of analysis. Um, so once we have this data, the goal um, is, of course, to get neurons, to get synapses so that we can get a, a connectome. And the process that's, that's done at this point is, is something called segmentation. We have a 2D image here, and the idea is to come up with the labeling of this image or coloring of this image where each color is a separate neuron, or we could separate these, these neurons out um, automatically. And, and to do this, it's a very uh, complicated uh, process that requires um, several advances, has required several advances in deep learning. Uh, we turn to our collaborators um, at Google. Um, this is um, the Connectomics group at Google, um, led by Varen Jain. Um, and they pioneered um, this algorithm a couple years ago called the flood filling networks. Um, the basic idea here is that they have um, a sort of a seed um, that they place um, in the data set and the seed automatically grows into regions that are cytoplasm. So you can think of this as almost like it's automatically tracing within the cytoplasm of the neuron. And uh, to do this, they trained a recurrent neural network to learn how to grow um, the seed. You can see this process here, um, not in real time, but this is growing out um, all these different seed points. The algorithm is determining what neuron, um, what's connected to the, the latest seed that was looked at. And the net result of this is that you can produce these very uh, nice reconstructions. This shows a result of ring neurons um, that innervate the ellipsoid body um, that, that were pulled out automatically actually with Google's um, algorithms. Now, unfortunately, uh, Varen can't talk today, uh, be at this, uh, this meeting today. Um, if there are any questions about the segmentation process, I could try to answer as best as I can. Um, obviously other directions or connect, uh, and, uh, questions I'm happy to, to direct to him. Um, but I wanted to point out at least uh, uh, another caveat to this. So people often advertise and talk about the flood filling network or algorithms like this that make a huge difference to the data set. But a lot of times there's um, several other aspects that are critically um, important that often go under the radar. Um, the left side of this image here um, you know, shows uh, the image data set as it may exist in some parts of the data. So this is actually a little snippet of the hemibrain that looks a little bit blurrier. Um, so one of the challenges that, that, that any kind of machine learning algorithm can have is how well it generalizes to data that it hasn't trained on. And so this shows an example of, of some blurrier data that existed in the hemibrain and the resulting segmentation, which you can see does not look uh, particularly good. Um, so in the last couple of years, Google has also been really improving algorithms to do kind of um, a transfer learning. They're using these uh, generative adversarial networks, these deep neural networks, that translate one image into something that looks a little bit more like the type of data it would see during training. Um, for people that are not familiar with this process, it's, it's a similar type of algorithm that people use when they take a picture using, a, um, using natural images and they try to convert it to make it look like a Monet, some work of art, or you take something like a Monet and make it look like a natural image. Um, these types of algorithms for transferring an image to look like another type of image is similar to the types of things that that, that Google has been doing to try to make an image look like something that's more similar to its training data. You could see the 
quality of the segmentation that results from, from this process. The segmentation alone um, is not a connectome. We also need synapse production. Um, this is work that was done um, by uh, Gary Huang and our group. Um, you can see in this diagram to the right, um, the um, synapses are fly brain. This is a very typical pattern in Drosophila where you have a presynaptic site and multiple postsynaptic partners that are highlighted here with these yellow triangles. Um, you have the same challenges you have with any kind of prediction strategy where if it's a large data set, it's hard to generalize the data across that data, um, the data set. Um, the result of, of, of several months of effort here um, was to predict almost 9 million of these presynaptic sites and about 63 million postsynaptic um, partners. And just to put this into some context, because you might be like, oh, okay, well, the synapse prediction seems pretty easy and it doesn't seem like a big deal. If we were to spend one minute um, per annotation trying to find them and annotate it for a proofreader, which is about, about what we observe in practice, um, we would be able to, um, um, we would be able to get about 500. It would require us over 500 full-time proof or worker years to, to get it done. Um, so it's a lot of effort that we're saving by automating the process. Um, you can see the results of this effort here, this point cloud representation, each of these dots are actually different presynaptic sites and it forms this point cloud um, um, arrangement. You can see that the, um, you can actually see the neural pole boundaries. So it looks very much like uh, what you would see if you're looking at a confocal NC82 volume where the synaptic um, um, elements are highlighted. Um, just to get a little bit of a sense of the accuracy um, of the um, of the uh, of the data set and of the synapse prediction, this uh, uh, purple dot over here shows the agreement rate that typically exists between a couple proofreaders that are doing these tips annotations manually. It's around eighty percent. Um, and so what I have here is a precision recall plot. So the recall being the the percentage of the synapses that the algorithm finds, and the precision uh, being the percentage of the synapses that are predicted um, that are correct. Um, each of these dots represent a different brain region where we did synapse prediction. So we're trying to make sure that the algorithm generalizes um, across each brain region. The size of the dot indicates the, the number of synapses in that brain region, I believe on a log scale. I'm not sure though about that off the top of my head. Um, many of the brain regions are actually really high. There are a few that are lower, but for the most part, we have pretty good consistency across the whole brain in terms of agreement rate. Another way to slice this data so that we can understand whether we can trust the, the accuracy of the data is the, um, is the accuracy per cell type. So we looked at a large number of different cell types, about 1, 000, over 1,000 different types, and tried to look for each connection by sampling them, what percentage of those connections are correct. So this is a, a precision uh, measure. Um, so in particular, if you, if you have A is connected to B, it has a connection there, we would randomly look at one of those connections and we would measure the percentage of times that they were correct. And this is the case over 80% of the time, um, which, you know, if you have something with a few connections, you could be assured that, you know, with over 95% confidence that that connection is a legitimate um, connection. I mean, we looked at these connections upstream and downstream, and we see the same, um, same type of accuracy um, per cell type. There are a few outliers. Some of them we actually manually fix, um, but for the most part, everything is, is pretty, pretty um, um, consistent in the data set, which is great. Um, but even with that, um, there's still things that are missing. Um, we mentioned before the cell type annotation, the compartment uh, labeling, um, that I'm not gonna go into again because I described that before, um, but also the validation of the segmentation. And, and this is particularly problematic because whereas the synapses, if you have some errors, it's kind of statistical in nature, maybe you're making a few errors here or there, um, but hopefully um, you don't have anything very catastrophic. Um, but with segmentation, if you make uh, single errors, you can merge two or three neurons together um, the algorithm may glue multiple things incorrectly together, which causes a, a major change in the graph and produce um, incorrect data. And that would require um, some human correction. Um, there's a couple ways to um, fix um, the segmentation. And again, this slide might be a little bit pedantic, but it serves, uh, um, I think, a useful point um, for what our group did. So one of the things that you could do is you could do something called sparse tracing. Um, sparse tracing is the idea of reconstructing one neuron at a time. This is a perfectly reasonable way of, of taking the EM data set with segmentation to, to explore your specific biological problem. So for, an, for instance, what you might do is you might have a neuron X and you want to identify and trace all of its inputs. Or you might want to find a neuron that matches something that you've seen in light data. Um, this is, again, perfectly uh, reasonable to do and generally very focused. Um, this is uh, in contrast to something that our group does, which is dense proofreading, which is to try to reconstruct and proofread all the neurons. Um, this obviously takes more work because you're looking at everything 
Um, but it's also on the, on the flip side easier to estimate um, what um, what's left. I mean, if you don't have anything else to look at, um, then you've proofread everything. So you have some kind of measure of completeness, which is a little bit easier. Um, but the reason why I wanted to describe these things is, is that I think it's important to note that the sparse tracing itself is often not enough. Um, and the reason that our group spent a lot of time trying to make this dense and comprehensively proofread data set is that I do think it is a bit of a barrier of entry for many people, um, unless you have proofreading expertise or you can collaborate with people that are willing to proofread and uh, annotate the circuits of interest that you have, it can be very difficult to, to get uh, data out of the data set. Um, also, if you're doing sparse tracing, it's a bit biased by your preconceptions. You're gonna spend the work tracing the things that you think um, um, you are interested in, in trying to find. Um, I'll kind of skip through that a little bit for time, but I also just in general, it's very easy for local circuits to quickly balloon out into hundreds of neurons. So many times we look at this data set, someone's interested in a circuit, and then all of a sudden they find out that there's thousands of neurons involved in, in different ways. So to try to facilitate this process, our team um, developed a lot of different editing tools. These are, are tools, software that people use to, to revise the segmentation. Um, these are using 3D visualization uh, in particular to rapidly fix the data set. And this is where we had 50, actually over 50 proofreading years of effort working on tools like this. Um, so for instance, we show here um, a neuron reconstruction where there's some kind of error. You could see morphologically in the 3D and in the 2D that there's some kind of error um, and something getting merged. And you can look here and the uh, editors are able to very easily in 3D split this region off. So this is an example of something that uh, people, what people can do relatively quickly um, using these um, workflows. Okay, um, uh-oh, let's see, sorry. Okay, so now um, where are we going from here? Um, so in the past, we had these kind of smaller dense connectomes that we've worked on. This is, Flyme has been around for over 10 years. We work on these um, smaller reconstructions. Um, now we're working on, um, worked on the hemibrain reconstruction. And then the next steps, are, are the, the male CNS is to do the whole spinal cord or ventral nerve cord uh, and the brain region. Um, so um, the, the tentative timeline is to try to get this done in about a couple years. And I think we could speed this up quite a bit from what we did in the hemi brain with better segmentation and streamlined processing. Um, but I do want to note that even though it seems like we're kind of making all these improvements and we're moving from something like the hemi brain and we're, we're scaling up to do the whole CNS, um, but there's a lot of variables involved in this process. There are things that, that, that are, are hard to, to do um, at scale. Sometimes it's hard to get a sample that looks very good. Um, and so this process is, is definitely not push button. And so I think that's one of the things that I, I really think um, we could push for in the next couple of years is to actually kind of um, maybe try to get something push button for things that are much smaller. And I think this might be one way um, that we might see a big revolution kind of in this field is can we do several small volumes really, really fast? Like maybe we can produce a connectome, um, like 20 or 30 of these small connectomes like within, within a year. This would allow you to do various comparative studies or to look across species and to analyze circuitry differences that exist in narrow regions. So I think there's a lot of possibilities on that front to make things better. Um, to give people a sense of the costs involved, the Fly-In project is about a $40 million effort um, for this is a, over 10 years of effort. But the nice thing is in the last few years, we've actually probably reduced this cost by maybe 10 or 100 X um, from what we had before. Um, right now, the cost is still dominated by proofreading. Um, and so that's the main mechanism is we're just trying to make the segmentation and the analysis tools or the uh, proofreading tools faster um, to, to make that more cost efficient. Okay, so with this data set, there are a lot of challenges of how to use the data. Um, in particular, there's a lot of data. Um, the neurons span several brain regions. It's hard to be an expert on everything. Um, notably, the a simple lookup table is not so s a simple. This is, a, I think, a, a typical example of a neuron in the central brain. And the inputs and outputs of this neuron, just looking at some of, uh, of something that has more three or more connections, um, easily take up large portions of the brain. So it doesn't take very long for something very simple to look very complicated. Um, so to help uh, solve this, we introduced a, a tool called NewPrint. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because I, I really want to just show some of the, the, the web uh, tools um, in, 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 a, in a few minutes. But we introduced a tool that basically allows you to break down the data kind of in a hierarchical way. So you can explore connectivity in a graph-like way, but you can also explore data at a region level, at a neuron level, at a synaptic level, at a skeleton level, 
And the idea behind this is to give um, researchers the tools to be able to work at the level of abstraction that they need to have to solve their problem. Um, I'll skip through that, um, but it just basically says that, that we have a software ecosystem that people can access um, the, the workflows with. Um, I think a key point um, to a lot of the things that we're trying to get a better handle on is, is how to actually work with this data in a way um, where we don't have to look at everything. And so a classic um, thing that someone could do is, is, is model reduction. I'm just showing here a, a very crude skeleton uh, uh, semantic or, uh, schematic for a neuron um, where you have inputs and you have outputs here. And if you wanted to simulate this neuron, in this case, just using maybe a simple linear passive model, um, you, you, you would have to put all these compartments into some simulator and then you'd have to get some result out um, to simulate um, what the delay and amplitude responses would be for injecting current um, at these different sites. And one thing that you could do if you wanted to reduce this and make a, a simpler model is to do a point model um, where you just have a simple, uh, single uh, number for inputs and outputs per neuron. But something that we've been looking at, um, I think that seems to work reasonably well, is more of a region model. Um, it seems to be the case, at least for the, many of the examples that we've looked at, um, is that the, um, that the brain regions tend to be isopotential. The, that means that the, that, that the delay seems to be relatively quick within a brain region, at least using a simple linear passive model. And as such, we could potentially reduce the model into something where we show the delay um, response uh, per brain region then, rather than having to model it for every single um, node uh, in the skeleton graph. Um, this shows an example um, of why we, we believe we could do this. This shows a given neuron that has inputs in this region called the GA, sending outputs to three different regions, the GA, the EB, and the PB. Um, and you can see that the output response and the delay and amplitude, this is the amplitude, this is the delay response, um, has three distinct clusters for three different regions that, that they go to. Um, and, and, so, and then in, within each of these regions, they tend to have a very tight um, grouping of delays. Um, which justifies at least a little bit of the, of the grouping that we're talking about. Um, I'll skip through this um, next part in interest in time, but I just want to say that we, we looked at different corners of, of, of membrane and external resistance. Um, we're doing some of this analysis. There'll be more details in, in a paper that will be coming out um, shortly. Um, I think we can use this type of information, this, this recognition that the brain regions are potentially a reasonable proxy for breaking down the complexity of the neuron um, through this example here, um, which shows two neurons that are connected, they're actually coupled into two different brain regions. So we have one neuron A that sends outputs to neuron B in two distinct regions, in this case, the calyx and the, um, I think it's the, um, it's the LAL, sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, oh, lateral horn. So the lateral horn and the, the calyx. And so let's say, for instance, you could represent this as you know, a simple graph of saying A is connected to B 15 times. You assume there's 15 synapses or connections between them. Um, but this is a rather crude way of potentially representing this. And we would argue that maybe something that would be better would be to break this down and say that A is connected to B maybe seven times in the calyx and eight times in the lateral horn. Um, we have visualizations to kind of drive this home. Um, this is something called a sunburst plot where we show a neuron ID, its inputs and outputs, and its breakdown by brain region and breakdown by cell type. Um, so I think I'll, I'll just, uh, an interest of, of doing something that may break in a live demo. Um, I'm gonna try to do this uh, quick um, show of the, of the uh, tool, uh, the new print tool. So hopefully everybody can see this. Um, but this is this, uh, a tool that you can go online right now. It's on newprint.genelia.org. Um, we have uh, this, this graph here that shows a breakdown of neuron to neuron connection by brain region. And you can see these different stats, which I think is, um, um, which, is, which is very exciting to see a breakdown per region. Um, there's various things like you can see their skeleton shapes. Um, if you are inclined to look at the grayscale, and the grayscale is quite beautiful, you can look at it um, using uh, Google's NeuroGlancer tool um, here. Um, you can do various queries um, that we have available. I had mentioned um, before this idea of, of finding similar uh, neurons using um, using uh, the brain regions. And that's something indeed that you can do here. Um, sorry, I have a lot of windows open on my screen. So this shows um, a set of neurons that have similar innervation patterns um, to the one, uh oh, sorry, um, to the one that, I, that I'm querying over here. So let's see if I can bring this over. 
Uh, yeah, so you can see here that there are a set of neurons with similar um, innervation patterns to this given neuron here. So this tool, I think, uh, is hopefully very useful for people facilitating a broad range of different types of analysis that, that people uh, might be interested in doing. So let me um, jump, jump back to the um, presentation right now. Um, and I want to just take the last few minutes to provide some initial findings. Now, I, I apologize in the sense that I think ideally it would be very useful to probably spend 10, 15 minutes maybe discussing each one of these findings. Um, it, so I don't, I, in risk of making a little bit of a grab bag, I'll show at least some, um, some results. But I think the thing that I really want to highlight is that the things that I'm showing are, are the types of results that are aided by having information across several brain regions. They're aided by knowing all the neurons um, that we can reasonably find in the, in the data set. Um, so there's not bias to particular subsets of neurons that we have interest in. Um, so one of the things that would be very uh, kind of a common thing for people to do is to try to look at the graph properties and how they might vary per region. This is a, a, a subset of different brain regions that exist in the Drosophila that we uh, chose here. There's actually several more, but this is uh, useful for, um, for this example. Um, this shows the number of neurons that are in these different brain regions. So you can see some vastly different numbers that exist um, per brain region, um, indicating high and low by the, uh, the green and yellow. Um, the number of links between those neurons, the, um, the diameter uh, um, that uh, to go from one part of the, the graph to the other, the average number of partners, so this is the K value here, that exists per neuron. Uh, notably, this rubus has very few partners per neuron on average, whereas something like a mushroom body has a lot. So you can see, again, very large variance, which is interesting. So there are vastly different properties that exist per brain region. This is the average connection strength. Uh, point out here, the ellipsoid body, EB, has a very high average connection strength. This will be relevant in a couple slides. Um, this is the number of connections that exist on average for non-reciprocal reciprocal connections. And these are the number, the strength of reciprocal connections we see on average. And this is the percentage or fraction of connections that are reciprocal. Uh, notably, notice a very high fraction that exists for, for certain uh, neuropils. So a large percentage of the connections are in fact reciprocal. Um, this is especially the case in the ellipsoid body again. Um, this is the average distance that exists, the number of inner neurons that you need to go from one neuron to another if you look at pairs of neurons um, in a given brain region. Again, you could see a, a wide spectrum of, of results that exist. Uh, five um, minutes. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yep, I'm almost done. Um, so the fly brain, uh, this is another result. So I, I just, again, I'm, I'm kind of surveying different topics. So I apologize for that. And the questions and answers, we can surely go into some more detail on some of these. Um, the fly brain appears to have very short paths. This chart here shows um, we're sampling every pair. We're not sampling. We're looking at every pair of neurons in the data set that were traced. We're trying to find the number of inner neurons it takes to get from one neuron to the other. Now, these lines represent different thresholds. So if you're looking at every neuron that just has, or every connection that just has one connection or more, um, that's indicated by the red line. If you have a very st a strong threshold that requires you to have 20 or more connections, that's indicated by by this line over here. Um, but let's say, for instance, you have 10 connections and you say all the paths that you care about have 10 synapses or more. Even with just a few inner neurons, you get over 50% of the neurons are connecting to each other. Now, that suggests that things are very interconnected, um, that, that it's a relatively small world um, in this fly brain. Um, and we can kind of uh, compare this to the number of inner neurons or the number of inter uh, gates or logic that's required for um, design. Um, uh, design, electronic design. And notably, I think for people that are familiar with electronic design, um, human design, artificial design, is that people, uh, the, the chips, are, you know, have various constraints that make it a little bit harder to do things the same way that you would do maybe in a biological circuit. Notably, you want to uh, optimize very short wire lengths. Um, you typically have a fixed clock. A lot of these things allow, um, force people to design their circuits in such a way that they have several layers of logic that are stacked on each other. And one layer feeds into another layer, which feeds into another layer. And you usually only have a fan out, maybe a few different gates or logical units. Um, and so you could see that the number of these levels, these logic levels that are needed are, are much higher um, if you consider um, um, digital logic. Um, here's another plot um, that shows connection uh, distribution. 
Um, and what's interesting about this is, is, is this is a power law relationship. This on this side shows the strength of the connection. I want to point out strength. I mean here is the number of synapses in parallel, not the area of the synapses. Um, this is the number of links um, with the specified strength. So notably, the number of of, of of connections that have strength one are dominate um, the the number of um, the number of connections that exist in the volume. And you can see this uh, drops uh, precipitously as a power law with exponential uh, um, uh, tail there at the end. Uh, and I think what's interesting about that, I mean, we can't necessarily make a very strong uh, comparison to mammalian tissue, but at least some of the information that I've seen out there is that it, that follows more of a law of normal distribution. Um, but we do see a lot of these small connections. Now, are they mechanistically important? I think a lot of people might think that they're not. Um, we have looked at a lot of these manually. Um, a lot of them are real, or they appear to be real in the data set from what we can see. Um, but I just note that. Um, a final, uh, final point is an observation that can be made using um, um, work that's been done in electronic design. This is a property called Brent's Rule. Um, this observation that designs, electronic designs, are typically optimized for compactness. And notably, um, there's this uh, observation that the, the pins have a power law relationship with the number of gates or computes that are in logic. So these are the pins, the inputs and outputs, and this is the number of gates or the number of, of the compute that exists within some kind of electronic component. And you can imagine a couple extremes that exist in practice that people can use on this scale where all of the compute, all the compute that you have here could be like a spreadsheet and every single cell in the spreadsheet can be manipulated by a user. So basically there's an input and output for every single compute um, for, for that spreadsheet. So that's one extreme. The other extreme might be some kind of serial input device where you only have inputs going into a simple stream um, and, and you can have a very big device, you can have a very small device, but, they, but it's in, it doesn't matter because there's still only one input. There's only one um, source of data that's going into this logic. And so we can plot this, and people have plotted this, whoops, um, this chart. And so here I'm, I'm actually showing compute as number of T-bars, the number of presynaptic elements. And here are the neurons that exist between, um, uh, between these compartments. So I can break this down and I can look at each compartment of the brain. And, and what I'm plotting here, so if this were electronic design, this would be gates and this would be pins. Um, this is the regime that, that typically electronic designs fit in here. Um, again, kind of optimizing for compactness. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, we noticed that the, that the different brain regions, you can't read this all here, these are all different brain regions, seem to fit mostly in this narrow band. Um, maybe one notable exception is the EB I mentioned earlier, but notice how the EB had some very interesting uh, properties that there's actually a lot of compute going on um, for the amount of connections potentially going in that region. There was a lot, um, very short distance between average neurons in there, there was a lot of reciprocal connections. Um, but again, I don't know if you could take anything from this except to say that maybe there are some, some constraints um, in, the, uh, in the system that, that optimize for compactness. And we've seen this in other studies that have been done in the past as well. Um, I kind of want to conclude this talk by just saying that I think we're really just on the tip of, of kind of the tip of the iceberg here of analysis of what we could potentially do. We're going to have a paper we're going to release probably in the next week or two. They'll highlight some stuff and some other work that's being done in the mushroom body circuit and the central complex. But I think the richness of the data goes well beyond that. We're not even looking at a lot of the ultra structure, other things that are in the EM data, the mitochondria, the vesicles, et cetera. I think a lot of things are amenable to various uh, types of analysis. And so I'm really excited about what the, the future can bring and, and all the amount of work and challenges that that will be faced with. Um, I want to use this to thank um, a very, um, very uh, large team that we have, a steering committee, our collaborators um, at Google and outside at Genelia, um, our software staff, and probably last but not least, all of our annotators and proofreaders that, that we really, um, really needed to make sure that this was a possibility to get this done. Um, okay, with that, I'll uh, thank you and I guess take any questions. Thank, thank you. you, Stephen. Um, if you have any questions, please ask them, uh, ask your question uh, in the Q&A uh, session. Right now, there are two questions, one from uh, Shavika from University of Freiburg, um, and the other one is from Daniel or Gardner. Yes, yeah, so I'm uh, looking right through them right now. Um, let's see. Yeah, sorry, like I said, this is a little bit uh, uh, awkward. Okay, so uh, Daniel talks about in the Molluscan world, it looks as if all the neurons we know are famous, that is identified, and the same from one animal to the next. 
any sense predictions about the reproducibility of those 25,000 neurons from fly to fly? Okay, that's a good question. Um, if you're obviously talking about within species, we of course believe it to be pretty stereotyped. Although I should point out that it's not uncommon, even from left to right side of the brain, to have neurons that don't exist on the other side. Maybe it's missing randomly, or maybe there is a little bit of asymmetry. Um, but for the most part, at least within a given species, um, we believe it to be pretty conserved. Across species, I think that's something we really want to analyze on a lot more detail. Clearly, at a high level, several of the structures we see, there are certain types of patterns that have been examined, like, for instance, in the mushroom body, uh, with projection neurons and, 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 and claws that exist that, that you know, that, that people have observed um, these patterns in different species, although with slightly different connectivity rules. Um, so I, I can't make a definitive statement, but I would expect that a lot of things would be similar across insect species. And I think in the next couple of years, we are going to get more, uh, more information about that, especially as we start kind of doing a lot of these rapid small connectomes, which I really do think is going to be one of the future um, areas to work on. Um, I'm not seeing the other connection or question. Um, oh, um, so we can ask which classification algorithm is used to classify synapse, synaptic connections as presynaptic connection and postsynaptic connections. Uh, so the, the algorithm right now, so it's a relatively a simple a deep learning technique on the surface um, that's using a semantic uh, prediction of presynaptic sites. So in the, in the fly, and I don't know if it's um, how easy it is for me to, to jump back here, but in the fly, the presynaptic um, region is, is very, at least for our staining, is very well, um, very well highlighted. Let me see if I can pull this out very, sorry, I apologize. Okay, and of course they had animation over here, so I don't have to turn the slide back on. Okay, so this is the presynaptic region here. So this tends to be relatively dark in our staining. So what we do is we train a classifier. We actually just put a dot here, single dot, and we take a sphere around this region and we train a classifier to say, is there a synaptic region there? And, and this will center a dot typically in this presynaptic site. And then we use a second cast. We're using this presynaptic site and the segmentation and other features that exist in the grayscale here, we can then predict the postsynaptic partners. So this is a little bit different than maybe in mammalian where things look a little bit, maybe um, a little bit more symmetric, I guess. Um, here we have this very strong uh, presynaptic uh, clue. Um, now this isn't the only algorithm out there. There's another algorithm that we actually are using um, in conjunction with this, which is actually trying to learn with a loss function that's based on sort of this, these pairwise distances. And so they're trying to learn these relationships directly. This is a work by Jan Funke um, and several others. And we, we actually trained two classifiers, one to do this, one to do that algorithm. And then we combined it into some kind of hybrid approach um, to, to generate a better result. Um, does that answer your question? Yep. Um, so the next question is from Wenrei Zhang. Uh, do you think spike sorting is useful to identify neurons? Um, well, if we have that information, maybe. <laughs> I don't like. I like. I mean, I think in fly, it's very, very difficult to do those types of simulations. So, um, and I and I, like I said, unfortunately, I don't, really don't have that background to be able to make a definitive, uh, definitive uh, claim on that one way or another. If we did, but I think one of the things that we're trying to move to a lot. Um, and fly is a lot more of a voltage sensed, sensed, uh, sensing imaging as well as calcium imaging to kind of get information um, in terms of its, its response to different stimulus, um, but in terms of actually measuring spikes that may be hard. And also I should point out that, that in fly, there is a lot of, of passive uh, connections as well, um, which makes it, or graded connections, I should say, sorry, as well, that makes it a little bit challenging. Okay, uh, the next question is from Claire McKellar. Uh, nice talk. What percentage of synapses were proofread? Yeah, um, sorry, I, I mentioned that very quickly, but I, I think it's probably somewhere between, well, maybe around 35% right now. So this means that 35% of all the pre and post pairs, so again, we're, they're polyadic, but if you look at a given edge, simple edge of going a pre to one given postsynaptic site, 35% of those edges are in what I would call a trace neuron. Um, and we have, um, Several, probably, I mean, it's hard to say off the top of the head, but we also have probably a few million more that were in segments that were, uh, oh, it's hard to explain this, were speculative merges. This is part of this process called focus proofreading that we do, that we didn't proofread, but we looked to see if it would have an impact on the circuit, and if it didn't, we just ignored it. So there's a little bit more that we haven't looked at. Um, there are, is a variance in regions. So some regions of the uh, brain, for instance, 
um, have a completion percentage that's much higher, like 70%, 80%, I think in a couple cases. Um, we did this primarily in the central brain regions. We were doing a lot more analysis. There are other brain regions where the completion percentage is a little bit lower, but we try to have a minimum bound, I think of around 20% or so. So there's no regions that's horribly bad, but in those regions that, yeah, maybe the bigger connections are gonna be a lot more trustworthy than the smaller connections. Okay. Um, so the next question is from Annika Barber uh, from Rugrats. For neurons that I'm interested in, uh, including producing cells, uh, uh, insulin producing cells, the data set uh, counting more neurons, uh, about 22, when all experimental data suggests there are 14. Where does the, this type of discrepancy arise? Will there be ways to reconcile to experimental data in the future? Um, okay, so what type of neuron? I'm trying to find that question. I just want to send it over. Insulin producing cells. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, I, I think this might be better to take offline in the sense that I'm kind of just curious exactly which studies you're, you're looking at in particular, because I'm, I'm not 100% familiar, obviously, with, with, with everything people could be interested in. But one thing I will note is that in previous work that we've done, almost always it's the case that we find a lot more in EM than anybody's seen before. And so I think this is just because a lot of the techniques that people have used for labeling and other analysis are sparse in general. This is very comprehensive. I, I think it's generally unlikely that we're missing neurons or, or adding neurons that shouldn't exist. Of course, there definitely are situations where things could be misclassified. I mean, you could look at the, the morphology of the neurons in a particular uh, group that you have, and you could check to make sure um, that these are all in fact the type that you're, that you're interested in. But if the, the neurons exist in the data set, they, they do exist, uh, most likely. Um, so Claire wants to um, clarify his, uh, her question. Um, uh, she was asking about proofreading synapses themselves. Oh, okay, yeah. So, we, so what we did is, is because there's like 60 million of these points, it's not like, it's not like segmentation, like where we can look at maybe the biggest 100,000 segments and improve the quality of the data set. If you want to make a statistically significant improvement in the synapse uh, quality, you would have to look at tens of millions of synapses. Each one of them is an isolated point um, with some distribution or likelihood of error. And so because each of those are kind of disjoint, what we did instead was is more this iterative process that we would look in different regions. We'd sample the region, and then we would take that training and improve the classifier. And then our final results, we then take some of our ground truth data and then estimate the error intervals that exist. So it's a little bit more of an iterative process of continually to refine the classifier. Um, you know, this, this whole process requires a lot of iterations that you should in the initial loop. So, yep. Um, I, I saw okay. here there's a, 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 an expansion of microscopy question, um, mm -hmm. which I, I think is uh, always fun. So I just I'll handle that quickly. Um, this is uh, Ruhan uh, Zhang. Um, says that uh, besides uh, EM expansion microscopy, will be will uh, expansion microscopy be able to provide the same resolution? I I'm very interested to see um, the advances in, in um, expansion microscopy. Um, I think um, I think there's going to be a lot of challenges to do it densely. Um, I know there are people that are working on it, um, and I think like anything, maybe you could see the connection, but then all of a sudden, when you do care about other aspects like vesicles and stuff like that, um, you won't be able to see that in the same imaging uh, mode. But there are definitely experiments going on. And, and, and I think maybe what could be very useful in the future is once we sort of figure out something at the EM level, then maybe we could rapidly try a more isolated study using a, um, XM to see if we can find an underlying pattern over several samples. Okay, uh, is there any more questions? Are we getting ready uh, for the next speaker? We can probably answer one more question. Uh, this is from uh, Katrin Vogt. Uh, how much do we know about neurotransmitter expression and <laughs> receptor types? Uh, again, uh, a lot of work, at least on, on that's going on, a lot of work in multi-fish to identify those transmitter types. Um, I think I'm not an expert in this domain insofar as that there are different ways to get this information using confocal data that have varying levels of accuracy. So it depends on what data that you like to, to believe, um, I guess, at this point. But right now, we only have, I would say, you know, dozens of types where we know the transmitter. And as you point out, um, we would really need to know the receptor as well. Um, even if we assume that each neuron expresses one transmitter, you know, Dale's law, which may be more or less reasonable, the sign is going to be dependent on the receptor. 
Um, and so I do think there are challenges ahead. And one of the things that I'm actually somewhat hopeful is that maybe there are ways that we can train a classifier to look at the EM data with enough training data to maybe determine that automatically um, through some predictive means, but we would probably need more data to prove any such algorithm. So I think we're still a little bit of a ways away, but there is more data coming in and, and I'll at least cross my fingers and hope that in the next couple of years, um, some of the multi-official efforts will help us um, um, find, uh, at least identify a lot more of the transmitters. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can ask, still ask, ask on Q&A, maybe Stephen can answer them by typing. So we'll go to the next talk.